dangerous virus is spreading rapidly in China. The National Institute of Health. More than 4,100 died from COVID. You see the death. New virus Our fears that the Dow will drop and drop quickly. And we're already what you might be looking at right now. This circuit breaker. There is very little separation. There was looting underway nearby. The power of the president. Everybody. The growing political polarization in America is hard to ignore. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Three Words, a bite-sized podcast about the simple and yet strategic choices that we can all make in order to become the very best version of ourselves. My name is Dr. Michael Brown, and I am the host of Three Words, and we are actually today going to talk about a second question in a three-part series, Country in Crisis. If you listen to the first episode, it was the question, is crisis inevitable. The second question we will talk about right now with my dear friend, Steve Risky, thought leader, historian, uh, good friend. We have journeyed together for the past 28 years. And Steve, I'm so honored to be in this conversation with you, this three-part conversation with you under the umbrella of country in crisis. We had a great conversation uh, in the first episode, Is Crisis Inevitable?, And now let's engage in a second conversation around this three-word question. Is truth knowable? (laughs) Is truth knowable? It seems to me, and again, I'm not an expert, but that people are believing different sets of facts uh, in in this day and age and actually claiming that their facts and their truth is true. So it makes me wonder, it makes me curious, is truth knowable? What are your thoughts? Wow. Because that thing you just said, it used to be, here's the facts and uh, here's my opinion of, here's my value set or whatever. Mm. Um, But we've noticed in the last number of years that people are, the very facts of the matter are no longer agreed upon. And how can you have a value discussion when you can't even agree about the facts, right? Right. It's, and, it feels impossible. Yeah. And then you wonder, how the heck did we get here? What changed? Mm. And uh, and I think if you were to listen to the, to the sides, so to speak, they would both say the other side's fired first, right? So maybe I, I, I do remember the first election I was listening to where it was the, uh, cause we're watching, you're watching the, the post election results that night. Yeah. Who's going to win and what states come in. And I watched newscasters use the word we to describe the Democrats on like national television. And mm. I was like, Oh my goodness. And that for me was one of the first times. And I think I'd always felt like, okay, well, you know, ABC probably skews left or whatever. And, mm-hmm. and, but I was amazed. There was the moment where everyone began to admit it. That if I was going to be watching, you know, Fox News or whatever, and they were saying we, they meant the Republicans. Yeah. Like when I watch a Browns game and I say we won, like, you know, like, me and the Browns, we won. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think that that way of thinking, hmm. uh, goes back to, uh, you know, this, we, I don't know, I keep putting it on our generation, but a really remarkable thing did happen in the 90s with the rise of the postmodern movement and multiculturalism and all those things that came with it. And we can blame Gen X, but it's probably someone else's fault. But uh, that we began to say concerning, like, let's say religious belief, that not, not that it's not knowable, but rather a, a very awkward statement saying it's all equally true. Hmm. What's true for you is true. And what's true for me is true. And we began to say, I think we can make that work as a way to try to keep us in some sort of group together because our belief sure, systems sure. were so varied. But it has a pretty high cost. It does. It feel, I feel it now. Yeah. So what I've, if I say everything is equally true, well, with a little thought experiment. So imagine you find a group of people who are raised in a cave and they've never seen this thing called sky. And you're telling about it and each of them have a view in their mind of what sky might look like, what color it is, right? Well, logically speaking, if I were to say they were all equally correct about their color of sky, they're all either said blue or no one said blue, Hmm. right? So since we don't have the same color, if they didn't all say the same color and I said they were all equally correct, all I've really said is no one, no one's right. None Hmm. of it's true. Hmm. The, uh, the, the awkward, 
backwash to the idea that everything's equally true is to say none of it is. Mm. And we, we found that, um, and, and as we, uh, as we talked about faith and, and sort of metaphysical belief, but I find that more and more metaphysical belief crossed in the ideas like religious belief and, and, or, uh, sorry, political belief and, right, and right. even anything that I can't know with my two eyes. Like I didn't count all those votes. You can, mm. you can tell me the facts all you want. The fact is I didn't see it with my own eyes. So therefore I am forced to believe. I'm forced to believe what I believe about it. I tend to believe that the election was fair enough. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's, there's any, I'm not one of those people, but, uh, but they have their reason and they also are unable to see the evidence with their own eyes and are forced to believe sort by faith, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And that nothing's true. Everything's true thing is really hatching real consequences, uh, a generation later now. Yeah. And you were talking about the, uh, earlier this idea of the three ways to know truth or the mm-hmm. three kind of, can you talk about that for a second? Okay. So if you, if you ever in, in college or somewhere had to take a philosophy class, you get this like, how do we know that we know that we know is known? <laughs> and, and it sounds like this, like uh, this ridiculous who cares conversation. Oh, we care now, but uh, the, <laughs> right? ask, the actual, and so it's called epistemology, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a notion called epistemological humility. And so I'll give like three versions of how one might. Epistemological humility. Yeah. So epistemology, the study of how we can know, right? Right. Um, So on one hand, I might say something like nothing is knowable. And that can sound a little silly after a while. You know, it, it, it's, it's impossible to know. I'm about to walk across the street and there's a large truck barreling down at me. Who knows if it'll kill me or not? It seems like we could know something, right? <laughs> right and right. that, and it seems like we should even be able to make value decisions and, and, and responsible personal decisions to not walk in front of a truck, uh, it, because of what we're able to know. Then there's another version of belief. We'll often call this something like fundamentalism. Fundamentalism says, I know what is true. Hmm. And therefore, like what I believe is actually true. And because it is true, therefore, I can actually cause all to have to be shoved underneath it. Something like what I believe is right. Therefore, you have to come underneath me. And it, and I attempt, it attempts to make me an authority over everybody. And people will, will rightfully shove back at that. Right? Sure, sure. Epistemological humility would say this. Whatever the facts of the universe are. Whether or not Pluto is truly a planet, whatever is true about the president, the votes, what is true about God, what is true mm. about whether or not there's a guy named Bob living in Sacramento who's actually my cousin. It's not true. Uh, whatever those things are, I don't have access to all the information, but I have enough information to cause me to give a belief, but that belief has enough humility that I can admit mm. I might be wrong. Or at least in some way, because you talked about mm-hmm. fundamentalism, the fact that I am absolutely right, mm-hmm. absolutely all the time. And I've been actually in a recent conversation with a friend on finding common ground where we had this, this, this conversation about what would it look like to engage in every conversation, assuming that there's something that I am believing currently Mm -hmm. to be true that I'm wrong about. But it seems like what's happening in this country in crisis moment, right? That most of us, if not all of us, presume that the thing I believe Mm -hmm. and the way that I see the world and what I think to be true, that I'm right Mm -hmm. in all of it. So that makes you wrong in all opposing views. And I, that seems strange to me because I think if we, theoretically, we would think, well, surely I'm not right about everything. Theoretically. Theoretically, but practically speaking, it seems like we live as though we are. And then mm-hmm. I think, I think we talked about this earlier, but this notion, then I surround myself, you use the term echo chamber with people who will reinforce mm-hmm. my version of truth. And so I never really need to engage with another perspective unless I'm attacking it. It seems. Yes, like. that's right. Have you, um, have you ever seen the video? Uh, it's a, a experiment in something called selective attention where there's some people in a room with a ball and they say, what we want you to do is count how many times they pass the ball. You want to, and it's like not hard. You count it. And it's like, Oh, it's 20 and the video's over. And then they say, did you see the gorilla walk through the room? And you're like, what? And you rewind it and you see 
that literally a person dressed in a gorilla suit walked right through the group. I don't know if you've ever seen this, right? No, I haven't. Right through the group of people and kept and, and does a little like jig in front of the camera and keeps on going. Yeah, people don't see it. Almost nobody does. Interesting. Like first time I saw it, I, I dutifully counted the ball. I'm like, this isn't a hard exercise. This is weird, right? But this idea of selective attention says there are things even right in front of you hmm. that you won't see because of what you've and of course, in this case, they ask you to look for a thing, so you did it. But all of us have selective attention because even in the room we're sitting in, there's virtually, there's almost an infinite amount of information for us to grab in. No one can pull it all in. No one could pull in every single thing there is to know about even just the something as small as the room I'm in. So what our, what our mind has to do is say, what do I need to understand in order to figure this thing out? Selective attention. You're in a room, yeah. you listen to the speaker or the, and you might miss something going on. And once we recognize that that's what's happening, we actually have to say, Oh, I can't know all. How can I make room for the incredible amount of facts that allow mm -hmm. me to continue to move toward what I think is, is a well or a healthy life and to help others to do that without having to fundamentalistically rule yes. every single person's mind? Yeah. It's exhausting. Well, and it's just not doable. How does one live in a community or a country where that's, you know, happening? You know, I'm curious, and this is, is this out of this conversation and even some of the things we're talking about, is this where this notion of conspiracy theories has emerged or mm. help me connect this idea? Cause everyone's talking about conspiracy theories. Right. Yeah. Um, and so how does conspiracy theories connect to this notion of truth and facts and so forth? I would love to hear your insight on that. Uh, I think they come from one of two places. Okay. Well, let's talk about the conspiracy theory about whether or not we walked on the moon. You've, <laughs> right. There's the people who believe it was all faked in Arizona, uh -huh. right? Okay. There are, opportunity to well-being is not interfered with one way or the other on this. Mm. But being fooled is an awkward feeling. And so just the thought that somebody could pull the wool over my eyes and make me naive, make me a dupe, for some is just unbearable. And I would rather believe anything crazy than, than suffer the feeling mm. that I might not be able to know everything. And I can go ahead and accept what is given to me, even if I don't know it to be true beyond all passable knowledge, you know? So just that notion that someone might be lying to me makes me suspicious in all areas about the moon, right? Uh, it makes me suspicious in all areas and even angry. Well, perhaps. Okay. But I mean, for some people, they just like it. Right? Yeah, I is, mean, you might have met a person who's, uh, we didn't land on the moonist and they, they just love their conspiracy theory, but they tend to be maybe more uh, light spirited about it than this one. But what is attractive about that in general? I mean, <laughs> I don't want to be duped. Who I, wants to feel like the fool? Yeah. But now let's combine that with another one that says, what if my pursuit of well being is hurting somebody else? So we live in this little town, Bowling Green, and, and Bowling Green is, is, you know, you'll see it on magazines, one of the best little towns to live in, and the numbers bear it out, right? But what if, in order to do it, there is actually, uh, in order for us to have our prosperity and, and, and well-being that we have, there was outside of town a factory where a thousand people are slave labored, you know, like children, mm -hmm. child labor, or some horrible thing, in or, and to, to make the products that we have that we get cheap. What if, what if that was happening just outside of town? Mm -hmm. And we had access to it and realized in order for us to have our apparent well-being, someone else is being hurt. Here's the problem of isms. All of them promise prosperity. And virtually all of them, in order to work, will have an out group that is being trampled underfoot to create the well-being of the in-group. It just happens that way. Uh, we'll pick an Wow, in that is intense. But it always is true. We'll pick an easy one. But to, but to Americans, if I can just interject, who think that democracy, as they compare it to communism, for instance, mm -hmm. would think this is the fair way. This is the most fair. This is the most generous. We all have opportunity to climb the ladder of success. And so like, no. Yeah, but we've, we're struggling with the fact that we know that a great deal of American prosperity, even if it, even if we say it's over and it's in the past, 
was developed on the backs of actual slavery, right? Yes. Uh, or we could pick another ism so we could get away from government. But in the 60s, there appeared a whole movement, an ism that said we – can get rid of all of these, these mores and all of this repressionism and we can live free sexually. That free sex, free love is going to create, you know, make love, not war, right? It was, it was a movement that said we can actually bring in the, the well-being for everybody if we just get rid of all these rules and live free sexually. No problem. It seemed like it would work. Until, you know, STDs and then the amount of broken relationships. And then uh, we've got an, the Me Too movement and an incredible epidemic of child abuse and, 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 and even abortion. No matter what you think about it, the fact is someone's paying the cost for our version of sexuality. So these mm -hmm. every ism has a consequence and all of them. And you would say, except for the perfect one. And that's the goal, of course. Remember the, in the last one, we talked about a spectrum between let's get the right one or everyone has freedom. The right one would say we could create justice, real justice for everybody. Mm. The difficulty is, and this is what it means to be in a society like ours. The difficulty is if we choose all in on one, let's say like communism tried, we're going to find an out group, you know, like the, the millions and millions who died because of Stalin's communism or the millions and millions that died because of Mao's communism. There's always going to be somebody paying the cost unless we pick the right one. And boy, doesn't that leave us on the cr crosshairs of a horrible dilemma? Hmm. If we say we have the right one and we're wrong, we're going to do incredible damage. And if we give freedom to be in the middle, we're going to have a crisis. Huh. It's hard to be human, isn't it? It is hard to be human <laughs> in the context of a community. And, mm -hmm. and so... Steve, is truth knowable? Mm -hmm. um, facts, <laughs> it seems like, are disagreed upon. But we're, I feel like we're at this impasse, thus country in crisis. What's your suggestion? What do we do about this? Uh, if I were to, if someone were to say, hey, Steve, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever you say. Just do, I which just did. Steve, we'll do whatever you right? <laughs> I would say try to use smaller structures. Like, uh, I mean, even politically, I, I think that s states, local power, local, like uh, more local uh, organizations to be a part of where you create the societies um, that as we decentralize our power, it'll take away some of the horrifying need hmm. to, um, to, to try to rule every, like in our country, it's very difficult that Alabama and California are trying to rule each other. Hmm. They have very different cultures, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and to, you know, Ohio tends to be a mix of where all those things sort of come together, but some states are very much a specific culture. And man, and by the way, I would be all in. I would, I would preach from the rooftops local state power if it weren't for the fact that the African American community has so often been the ones trampled underfoot by that. Hmm. And once again, all our isms come back, crashing back down. I, yes. I almost had it. I thought I had it. Local power. Well, yeah. Well, Jim Crow laws were defended under states' rights. Man, mm -hmm. I can, every single thing I can raise up, I'll tell you the problem of it. This thing's actually hard, which is why epistemological humility is so terrifyingly important to say, I really think I have an idea, but I can be okay with not being horrified that someone would disagree with me because every idea that's been advanced with the sort of the iron fist of, of yes. assurity has done terrible damage to somebody. Always. Yes. So is truth knowable? Let's answer that question. Yes and no. Okay. Okay. So we, we could begin with a simple thing like I, I joked, but the truck hurtling down the road. Come on, we have to have some knowability, right? I, I'm able to gather enough evidence from my world around me to say, yeah, I can, I can figure this thing out. But then there's a set of facts beyond me mm -hmm. that I can't know that I cannot see. Right. You know, I've never actually seen a president of the United States. Never once. I've never laid eyes on one. Oh, you could say, what about on TV? Well, how do I know it's not an actor? We can do the yeah, how do yeah. I know thing, That's right? right? And you know what? I'm willing to accept that maybe at some point in my life, 
there was an actor playing some president for some stupid, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> sure. Right. Sure. I'm just going to go ahead and say the evidence seemed to notice how I did that. The evidence seems to suggest I've actually never seen Saturn. I've never looked in a telescope. I've never seen it. The evidence seems pretty strong based on what's around me, right? And then the fade continues from a surety because the evidence is clear with me to it's beyond me to some things like um, that become more difficult to grab enough evidence for to talk about with incredible surety. And in many ways, despite the fact that I'm very deeply and profoundly a man of faith, I have to accept the evidence that I have for God is not so overwhelming that a person who believes otherwise, I would think they're insane. Mm -hmm. Like if I met a person who, who doesn't believe that Joseph Biden exists, not, not that he's president. I've met those, right. But who doesn't even believe he exists. Yeah. I would think, man, the evidence seems pretty strong, right? But if someone tells me that I don't think God exists, I don't agree with their uh, conclusion about the evidence. But I also don't think they're insane, right? Right. I think, okay, I can see how you arrived. I don't agree how you arrived at that. And notice how as we move the amount of evidence, we move the amount of assurity. I think that's how we handle knowing truth. What's the evidence? And and how do we consider it evidence? And what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, the second conversation uh, with my dear friend Steve Risky in this larger a series on country in crisis. He kind of alluded to this, and we'll be going there in our third and final conversation here in the third question. Um, but we need to figure out then in light of the fact that crisis is inevitable and that truth is knowable, how do we live this out together? And that's really going to be the third question. And I would really encourage you to uh, tune into our third conversation under the Country in Crisis conversation series. And the question will be this, and this is where the rubber really meets the road and where it gets really practical in our daily lives. Is unity possible? For life coaching, consulting services, or to hire a keynote speaker, please visit dmbcoaching.com.